I talk to people and you know I talk to people from all over the, the country and even out of the country and it's almost a norm that um, doctors are not involved and obviously it takes a team um, but they're amazed that I'm actually the one doing all of the extractions and that I place all of the hairs and that's a very rare uh, situation in hair restoration. That was the voice of Daniel A. Daniel, MD, founder and physician at North Atlanta Hair Restoration, a boutique medical practice solely dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of male and female hair loss. You're listening to Hair Restoration with Dr. Daniel A. Daniel. I'm your host, Clark Buckner, and all season long, we'll be speaking with Dr. Daniel about how he and his team at North Atlanta Hair Restoration are helping his patients transform their everyday lives for the better. In this episode, we'll explore the biggest factors that set Dr. Daniel's practice apart from typical hair restoration clinics. As a licensed physician personally involved in every case, Dr. Daniel lays out the steps he takes to educate his patients, to perform safe and efficient procedures, and to give patients unparalleled results without interrupting their lives. Now, let's jump in. Dr. Daniel, how are you? I'm doing great, Clark. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I am looking forward to another session with you. And what's really fun about these is it gives me a chance and our listener a chance just to get to know you more and to, to hear close up what are the things people are asking you the most, what's on their mind, what you enjoy about this, some of our other episodes, we've dug into some specific activities of, of what you do. And I really want today to be about what differentiates, what separates you all from other practices. And, and I'll, this gives us a chance to maybe really dig into some of the aspects that you love and you might not get the chance to talk to you on a regular basis. So I would just love to kind of start us off zoomed out about what you do, but really why it's different than what we might be seeing elsewhere. Yeah, sounds great. <clears throat> well, I think uh, in general, there are three things that, that separate my practice from others. Uh, but before I get into that, I'll just say that I know for individuals that are thinking about either you know, medical treatments for hair restoration or surgical, you know, i.e. hair transplant, when you go online, it literally is like the wild, wild west because you get, you know, uh, different types of hair transplant, different types of PRP. Uh, people do it, you know, all different ways. Um, so I think what I lend to my patients initially, what, you know, when I do a consultation is to just educate. Um, and I found that there are three main areas uh, that um, people really focused on. So Yeah, I'll start with those. So when you're educating someone, and this is someone who has maybe been seeing some of that language online in the wild, wild west. So they're coming out of the wild, wild west, and they get to you, and that's where we're at right now. Sure. Well, I mean, the first part is, you know, they go online, and they'll actually see, like, warnings on there, uh, you know, warnings about hair transplant or warnings about PRP. Um, and then as they delve into it, they'll figure out that <clears throat> there are major warnings about uh, clinics that actually – are doing it with non-licensed clinicians and technicians. That's in the U.S. And there's, that's in the U.S. and and minimal uh, physician support, and uh, it's such a problem it, that even our society, uh, International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery, has a task force devoted to this. So, you know, they're they're online, they're confused, um, and really the biggest thing they they have is is if I get hair transplant done is it going to be safe? And uh, the question is, in my hands, absolutely. So what makes what I do kind of safer, um, you know, than, than other other uh, offices? Uh, for one, I'm totally involved from, far, from start to finish. So <clears throat> when somebody comes in from a consultation, I've looked at their medical uh, record. I've looked at, you know, uh, if, uh, any contraindications to, uh, and if we're, we'll focus on hair transplant, um, to hair transplant. I'll look at, um, you know, even medical options, uh, to, to help facilitate the hair transplant. 
Um, so everyone's kind of dialed in. So getting kind of a safe foundation going into the procedure is key. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of places have a sales guy who's a non-physician and not in the medical business at all, but is there, you know, getting a, um, a commission, you know, to get as many graphs as possible. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough foundation to start um, to start a medical procedure. Um, yeah, when you say people are seeing warnings, that's primarily you're saying because so many people out there are unfortunately they're not licensed. They don't have what they're supposed to have. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, or they can, you know, just look at, um, you know, comments uh, of different practices. And, and you know, some of the um, practices have terrible reviews, but, you know, they do such good marketing uh, that they um, uh, kind of enchant people to come into their practice. Um, so, uh, you know, the first step is really kind of making sense of what the needs are. And then um, whatever you do, uh, surgically or medically, it's all done in a very safe and medically supervised manner. And that means that I'm totally involved in the case. Um, unlike, uh, you know, many other clinics, um, that there may be a reputable, uh, physician or surgeon in the office, but they're not actually in the case. What's the difference between in the office and in the case? Well, um, in your own well, words, just, your own perspective. Okay, sure. Well, let, let's say you have a plastic surgeon um, that is also doing breast augmentations, um, maybe seeing patients in the office, uh, you know, doing other cosmetic work. Um, they buy a um, hair transplant uh, machine and then uh, pull in technicians to operate the machine, which means that the technician is, is grafting um, and... Um, oftentimes, you know, placing all of the graphs um, while the doctor's in the office, but they're not involved in the actual case. They're actually, there's a machine just working on its own. Well, it could be, you know, the robot, you know, artist robot, or it could be, um, you know, any number of uh, FUE machines out there. Um, and um, I would say, you know, companies like uh, Neograft and Smartgraft, I mean, they, they definitely, um, you know, kind of tailor to practices that um, have technicians come in and do the majority of the case. And we've talked before on here that your hands are on this from start to finish and your hands are, you're, you are the person. You are providing them this procedure by not an autopilot machine. Yes. You know, and the, and the crazy thing is that when I, I talk to people and, you know, I talk to people from all over the, the country and even out of the country, and it's almost a norm that um, doctors are not involved. And obviously it takes a team, um, but they're amazed that I'm actually the one doing all of the extractions and that I place all of the hairs. And that's a very rare uh, situation in hair restoration. Um what the ISHRS, you know, the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery recommends <clears throat> is that, well, for, first of all, they acknowledge that it's it's definitely a team um, event. It, it takes help, you know, to get this done. And I have two very experienced technicians that help me on every case. Um, but the, the surgeons, who, especially with follicular unit extraction or FUE, need to be doing all of the extractions and they either need to make surgical incisions uh, so that the grafts can be hand placed by technicians, or they need to place them with implanter pens, which we use. Hmm. Well, this that's a lot to consider and a lot of things to be thinking about. So that might be a good segue to our next item on our list. Yeah. Let's jump into what that is. Yeah. Well, the next item is concealment. So um, there's, you were just describing a lot of things going on. And certainly, being able to conceal this, that's one of the most common questions you're hearing about. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, um, I think because of uh, kind of social norms and perceptions of hair transplant in the past with plugs, um, people, the majority of people do not want anyone to know that they've had this procedure done, uh, particularly as it relates to um, hair transplantation. So, 
um, with FUE, um, most um, clinics will at least shave the back of the head, if not the entire head. And obviously, if you have longer hair, um, especially if you're a woman, um, you know, shaving uh, part or all of your head is just a no-go, you know, to have the procedure done. Or, you know, people are having to take two weeks off from work and just kind of be in isolation until their hair grows back in. And from my standpoint, that's that's unacceptable. Um, no, yeah, that's that's such a big ask. If you're trying to conceal mm-hmm. something and you're shaving a part of your 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 hair off, the back of your head. Yeah, and essentially, you know, uh, be, because the hair has to be short to actually graft the hair. Um, obviously, when it's all shaved, you can see all the hairs, and it's it's an easy procedure, um, you know, for the person actually doing the extraction. Uh, so we specialize in a shaveless FLE procedure, and I've had people have. My, the biggest case I've ever done is 3,100 uh, shaveless in a day, and he was wow. able to leave with his donor site concealed. Now, he had, like, major major uh, density back there, um, but the majority of our folks that get that have, you know, no portion of their donor site shaved, and then when they leave, the back of their head looks normal or close to it. And um, That's the that same. I mean, that is very short turnaround. Yes. And we do it 80% of the time. It's really what we're known for. And um, it's not a big deal for us. Um, it's a little bit more of a price um, given the extra work. Uh, but, you know, some places offer and they call it an unshaven or non-shaven approach, but double the price. Uh, they make a big deal about it. This this is our norm. Uh, so uh, we're extremely fast at it, efficient. We get uh, just as good of a graft, whether it's shaved or shaveless. And then, um, you know, uh, we can go up top. And, and because of the typical size of our grafts being less than a millimeter, we use implanter pens. I don't use a lot of extra fluid to lift the skin off the scalp. Um, I don't get a lot of bleeding. I get really good pain control. Um, so all of these things kind of come into where... Uh, Postoperatively, the healing is fast um, with minimal pain, minimal swelling in the face, and we have kind of a graft care, um, uh, you know, uh, protocol after the procedure. So, uh, you know, everything's clean and not a lot of scabbing and um, nourished and moist. So um, people get back into um, assimilation very fast. Fantastic. And you said there was three items earlier right do you want to yeah start wrapping well, the up final, that fi- yeah what's that final yeah item? well the final is the final is results so the results um you know are key um, but all of the other stuff plays into actually getting the procedure but if they get the procedure they want the best results so i feel you know after all the cases i've done and i've done over well over a million grafts myself extraction in Whoa. place yeah um on all all different types of hair and skin types we've done body and beard hair i've been in you know pretty long you know stressful cases but all of that you know i learn every case and and refine everything so um our model is to get perfect graphs um so that's the first step they're immediately stored in a special transplant solution uh, to where the, the hairs can stay there for even up to four or five days so they're totally happy in the medium and then uh, we get the grafts out and then they go from that medium into the implanter pen and then placed it's a direct stick in place so you know that gives the least amount of contact to the air where the grafts can get dried out and gives the grafts the best chance of of um surviving even though the survival rate should be well above 90 percent but actually growing quickly um, when I see people at six months, I mean, they generally have 60, 80, even 90%, um, growth. Um, and you, in a lot of, a lot, a lot of places it's 12 to 15 months. Um, and I think a lot of it is how traumatized the graphs were or how much drying, how much manipulation uh, was completed. So, uh, that, that, kind of lends into uh, all the results. So do you think when you first meet with someone, the questions that they're thinking about, do they know what 
that ultimately what results and what success does look like, or is it more, is it simple, simpler than that, more complicated? Well, I mean, you know, the people have to look at before and after pictures and kind of look at, like if we recommend 2,000 graphs, these are 2,000 graphs, uh, individuals with kind of a similar hairline and, and, and you know, um, ethnicity and, and, and uh, head design. And then, um, you know, they can they can make a, a reason, reasonable assessment. Um, but, you know, the, the results can vary depending on how thick each hair is. You know, if you have really thin hair versus very coarse hair, um, you know, you may require more graphs. Um, but, you know, uh, everyone's results are individualized. Um, and, you know, we make it happen. If, if somebody is um, is not at that really satisfied level, uh, we generally will help them out either uh, doing some platelet rich plasma injection therapy or even or even some uh, adding some grafts um, at no extra charge, uh, either to refine the hairline or, or make it make it better. Right. And I know you've been doing this a long time. You said you've you have done over one million of these individual graphs. Is that am I using the right language with that? Yes. And through all the time you've been doing this and when you communicate these three core things that someone is most interested in, are you surprised by anything to this day when maybe your first meeting with someone or someone's been on the fence about this, we know how intimate this is. We know how important this is. And you in previously previous podcasts we've done together, you've talked about how their whole life can change from the confidence they, they feel, how it impacts them at work, at home, everywhere. But does anything surprise you from I all think of this? The, I think the I think the biggest thing is that um I, I get the sense that most of my patients who have seen other consults, and, and many of them have seen five, six, seven consults, even more. I'm talking different different offices, um, and they've researched it for years. I just find that they can, you know, continually say, "You're the first doctor that actually spoke to me," uh, and and I feel so much more educated now. And you know, I um, I take pride in that. I, I love. Uh, meeting with people and, and, and educating. And, and, uh, if they're not educated, then it's, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, you've, you've really got to, um, um, educate and then figure out what their needs are and then present it, um, in a way that's not salesy, um, and, uh, in a way that's, um, that's caring. And, um, I, I, it's something that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of that I learned from my father, who is a physician. I spent a lot of time with him. That's how he was, and that's how it, I've modeled my practice. And I, I feel like, you know, my, my patients, um, they tell me that. Um, you're, you're a different type of doctor. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's something that comes from the heart. You know, I feel like people uh, understand that. And, and the good thing is that I'm busy enough. I don't need to sell anybody anything. Um, I can um, provide a great service, and if people are interested in doing it, I'm happy to help. And if they have more questions down the line, I'm happy to help. And uh, when they're ready to make it, the decision, I'm happy to uh, implement it. So that, that's the attitude that I think needs to be pervade. Well, Dr. Daniel, I appreciate you sharing more with us on this. I know this is a deep passion that you have and clearly you show that from start to finish, hands on this entire process. And I'm looking forward to more conversations in the future. Yeah, sounds great. Always love them. Thanks for listening to Hair Restoration with Dr. Daniel A. Daniel. You can book your free consultation today with Dr. Daniel by simply calling 678-845-7521 or online at nahairrestoration.com. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you listen to your audio content.